Welcome back, everyone. This is our Stories of the Week segment brought to you by the SANS Institute, the most trusted source for computer security training, certification, and research. Visit SANS.org to learn more. And by Tenable Network Security, creators of Nessus, the world's best vulnerability scanner. Jumpstart your security program today and evaluate Security Center CV, the continuous monitoring solution. Also, don't forget to register for B-Sides Boston coming up on May 9th, where I'll be presenting about robots, ninjas, and pirates. Hope to see y'all there. You like how I work that y'all in there, Mike, huh? You're from the South. That's right. Hey, it's a sitco sign. (laughs) <laughs> yes, Just because we live in the South doesn't mean we talk like them. <laughs> That's right. So, um, I'm going to put some shrimp on the Bobby, y'all. I'm going to talk about when Craig Hefner makes a post that says, What the ridiculous fuck, D Link. <laughs> <laughs> you know that it's going to be bad. And if Craig slow, thinks it's bad, slow clap. it's really <laughs> bad. And this is really, really bad. bad. I just can't even. So he found a bug in HNAP on the DIR 890. Yep. Um, they said the same bug was reported this year in the DIR 645 and a patch was released. And now D-Link has released a patch for the DIR 890L as well. So the patches for both are identical. So he'll examine the, the DIR 890 right. here. Right, and they were saying that the code in the hardware is almost identical Yeah, as well. Yeah. Um, so, so are they seriously using old stir copy and <laughs> oh my they god they seriously <laughs> are <laughs> that the stir copy is very common on, on these devices so essentially what they did was they tried to fix the problem but in fixing the problem not only didn't, didn't they really fix the problem but they introduced another buffer overflow <laughs> another bug I don't think it was a buffer overflow but they introduced another bug in the process. I read this, uh, this article was, came out just after we recorded last week, so it's been like a week since I fully read the article. So their patch to prevent unauthenticated sprintf stack on overflows now includes an authen- unauthenticated sprintf stack overflow. So the patch introduced a new bug, but not only that, they didn't, didn't fix, fix the... what it originally was trying to fix. Oh, Hooray. God. Hooray. Hooray. Patch. That word does not mean what you think it means. Yes. And wow, that's, um it's fabulous. Yeah. Stay classy, D Link is what Craig <sighs> Stay classy. <clears throat> it's very frustrating actually. That they can't fix their own software. God, it, it it's frustrating. These are problems that we can fix. Right? Like S print F these are not mm-hmm. really hard security problems to solve. So no, I no, like to read. No, no, more to the point. The, these are decades old problems now. I mean, no crap, right? I mean, there's at least 20 years in it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. So, Bored just... Elon Musk on Twitter is a spoof of Elon Musk. He put something out a couple of days ago. He said, you know, an app that will automatically uninstall itself after it hasn't been used for X amount of days. And I just kind of thought about that idea, too. What if we had, so- what if we had you know, hardware and software that literally self expired? The problem yeah, is when your router software self expires, you don't get access to the internet anymore. But that, be, that would be because be you haven't used it in a couple of days. Oh, that's true. It could monitor for connections. Yeah. Mine would uh, never self expire. Because that's the weird thing about either. hardware is we keep it and it stays around. Yep. For a really <clears> long time. <throat> we can make it self destruct. We can fun. make it self destruct, yes. If you haven't applied this firmware update in so long, it just self destructs. Yep. Forces you to update. Maybe that's how we solve the world's problems with these vulnerable routers. I like it. It's It'd something be, different. It'd take care of itself. So. It's sort of like the Mission Impossible approach. It just goes exactly. up. Yeah. So they're calling this uh, so hopeless, like Soho, like Soho routers. That's, of course, from the register. D-Link router patch creates new so hopeless vuln. Yes. Nice. Does it have a logo? <laughs> uh, no, but they put a picture of the D-Link router, which looks like a spaceship, an alien does. spacecraft, doesn't it? It looks impressive. But the firmware is not so impressive. Oh, well, clearly the marketing department's doing a great job. Yes. So it was kind of funny, that whole idea of like self-destroying mm. systems. I kind of thought a little bit about that in the past. And I could, you could program in that to a system so easily. You could. Oh, absolutely. You know, you could say, oh, well, you're putting in, for example, date time. Well, if you go past 2010, it doesn't work. It doesn't work anymore. It just goes back to 2010. Yeah, proof of thought. So let's, let's do that to libc, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Kidding. Uh, no, you're not. No, you're not. 
<laughs> I want to get everyone's thoughts. Uh, the RSA conference was this week, of course. Yep. RSA. It was. I didn't notice that. That's yeah. Weird. Did you notice that on Twitter? I followed a lot of what was happening at the RSA conference. But the opening keynote for RSA, or the, who was that gave this talk, um, that opened up RSA to 30,000 security professionals, um, was the RSA president, uh, Amit Yoren. And his, he's quoted as saying that we're basically we're losing was the gist of his uh, delivery in his presentation. And he says, to keep the barbarians away, we're simply building taller castle walls and digging deeper moats and taller walls are not going to solve our problems. So he pro- proclaimed that 2014 was the year that shows that we were truly in the losing battle and that we're building smarter walls rather than doing what he says is the, the solution to the problem and changing the mindset. Mm. Comments? Is, is he right? That, we, is that um, actually published at this point, or is it still just... Uh, the talk is not published, but an article about it is in the show notes. The quote's been yeah. talked about. Yep. Yep. So. Yeah. Yep. Um, I, I think there's um, a, a fair amount of truth to that, <sighs> and I think the industry is starting to come around to the realization um, that uh, we're, we, are, we are actually losing, but it, it's kind of like yelling fire in a crowded theater. Sometimes it takes people a while to react. But it's interesting that he gave this and said this at RSA, where hundreds of vendors released new products and updates yeah, to, t- to t- products. Taller walls and deeper moats. A lot of them that I read anyway were all about <laughs> the taller walls and, and deeper moats. Yeah, so I'm, I'm guessing he wasn't too popular after giving this speech. But, Probably uh, not. It's like calling uh, IDS dead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hmm. that never happened, by the way. <laughs> So I, I I don't know. And I saw a lot of examples of the mm-hmm. basically security technologies that don't really fix the underlying problem or even help you discover the underlying problem. They're just band aids, like IPS, like WAFs, like firewalls. I mean, these are all just band aids that are perfect examples of taller walls and deeper moats. But let's, you let's guys, about know, that. But you guys know that there's this terminally ill spiral of compliance and then response um, that's going on in the industry right now, right? And, and, and I say that, I mean, that some sort of regulation comes out and then the vendors line up, you know, to make their buck to respond to that regulation. And that, that's where this, uh, this appliance mindset is coming from. And it's, right? it's a great point, Joff, right? Because to meet those compliance standards, you can do that with a taller wall or a deeper moat. Well, right. you know, we haven't fixed the problem, but we've got this mitigating circumstance, which makes us compliant for now, so we're good. How do you build it Well, in? right, and, and right. Yeah, and exactly. Just, just taking the path of least resistance and saying, okay, we've met, we've met our audit and regulatory concerns, but we're still hacked. You know, it's not good enough, right? And, that, and that's, that's the essence of, of, of the point here. Um, it takes people. I, uh, we keep saying this at Black Hills, um, that it takes people – to think and analyze the data that you're looking at. You can't just throw an appliance solution at it. You, you, you're not going to win that way. You've actually got to train people to look at the important things that they're pulling out of any set of data, that, whether that's you know, the intelligent defender, the intelligent hunt teamer, the intelligent red teamer, you name it. They've got to pull out the, the, the things that matter to really understand the patterns of what's going on in the environment well, and that's, understand... That's Big you know. data has a has a promise for us, right? I mean, instead of just automating, I mean, a lot of what I've also seen this week is automation, him? automation, automation. Just say, look at that face. You, Santa said big data, and Carlos is like. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, Mike, I mean, Michael, say what you want to say. I actually do work with big data. We work with like terabytes of this stuff. It's ridiculous. All I'm going to say is if you have a good data scientist and you know what the hell you're doing, you have the ability to actually structure the stuff that you're doing and you can get to the place where it's not just automating broken processes, but you're, you're reducing your workload and you're looking for the right things, which then lets the humans that, uh, you know, and that, that level of intelligence focus on the right types of problems. You know, you, you asked about our thoughts on this. Um, I've, Mike, can, I've we, been can we get debating. big data? Can we get big data in the cloud? That's accessible from mobile, okay, okay, and will that make nice, the world a better nice. place? Only Look, if we none, have none of these threat ven- intelligence. None of these <laughs> vendors. <laughs> I, I got a message for everybody that runs the enterprise operation out there. None of these vendor solutions are going to do you any lick of good unless you don't know your environment. Do your it's sans top twenty, frankly. 
Do your hygiene, know your network, soup to nuts, know what's on your network, know what your user population is, know exactly what's going on in your environment, and you're going to be so far ahead of 99% of the other schmucks out there that you, you know, that, that, that then you can cherry pick the solutions from the buffet of what's available to you in the way that matters to you in terms of the strategy that you've developed because you know what's under your fingers. Yeah, but not everyone takes it that way, Joff. Some people look at the Sands Top 20 and go, oh, well, that's what I need to be doing. And they have their own kind of loose interpretations. Like, there's a standard that tells me what I need to be secure. So I'm just going to go follow that in that, there, again, a loose interpretation. Mm -hmm. So And I'm only going to do the bare minimum in yeah, that standard. Yeah, mitigate that. Well, I have a firewall. You know, that's that's cool. I yeah, all my, my, all my traffic goes through a firewall. That's it's a right. hole drilled through a firewall. The cable, the cable passes through. passing through it. Right. Yeah, I mean, yeah but so we, just sat, we just sit here and say it's not good enough. It's not good enough. You've got to know your environment soup to nuts. You've got to really have your elbows deep in this thing, right? I mean, you can't you can't just expect other people to run your world for you. Yeah. So, Jeff, here's the problem, is we, we build these solutions, we build these automated systems, but they lack context. Yep. We build something exactly. that says we're going, to, we're going to protect every website. Well, frankly, a Ruby on Rails site is really from a Java system. And mm -hmm. that's really, really hard. Uh, again, I work with data scientists all the time. We work with uh, about a dozen of them now. And they spend about 70% of their time just cleaning the data manually, yeah. by the way. You know, they tried their best to automate the process of cleaning it, but the reality is we find some weird stuff. I can't mm -hmm. talk about specifically what we do, but to give you like a really broad general example, I'm let's, say, <laughs> let's say that you have a, uh, a weather sensor out there, and you kind of put them around trying to figure out what's going on, and for some weird reason, you got this one weather sensor that always has water in it, even though it's not raining. Well, you're going to find weird stuff like that. And why is that happening? Oh, it's because it's under the water gutter. Dogs, <laughs> dogs peeing on it every day. No, it's weird stuff like that. And unfortunately, you know, you can do some laziness. You can say, oh, well, we're just going to strip out all the weird edge cases. But the problem is that you end up missing a lot of the outliers that are actually important. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the biggest problems of big data. You can do some amazing things with it. But again, you need smart people. You really need to have the context, which means whatever solution you have with big data is going to be extraordinarily context specific. Well, yeah, and, and you're, you're pointing out something that, that it's, it's obvious and, un, and yet overlooked all the time. The quality of your data is important. Mm -hmm. It's always been, right? I mean, as long as we've worked with data and conversion and anything else around it, the quality, the quality, the quality. And everybody goes, yeah, yep, got it. Okay, cool. So how big is this data source? Awesome. And you're like, no, nah, wrong question. I mean, volume, volume matters depending on the problems that you're trying to solve and, and, and the algorithms that you're writing and... and Data science is uh, is a really nuanced field, mm. and it still requires people to take a look at it at some point. And then it's it's a really cool loop, and it gets a lot better. Blah blah blah. I mean, you know, the thing I keep looking at I, to go back to the point to your question. Um, I think that if you're a leader, you have an opportunity to ask uh, to be aspirational. All right, I've I've mentioned that at least twice tonight because what I've noticed this week is it's all been doom and gloom. Every headline I've read from RSA is we've we've missed the boat, we're screwing up, we're losing the war, it's all bad bad bad. You're thinking wrong, you're doing wrong. You guys have lost. There's too many gaps. But guys, we wonder why people are burning out. We wonder why we're we're so jaded with this industry. Where is the where is it saying, "Hey, you know what? The world has changed." 40 years ago, we didn't even know these things existed. 10 years ago, these things weren't even possible. Look at all this stuff that we're doing, and yeah, I got it. We're doing IoT. We've got all these other things happening. Guys, look. The opportunity is ours. People are paying attention to security more than ever. Here's what we need to do to take advantage of that. That's the speech I would have liked to have seen. That's the speech a leader gives. I want to throw they, out a they, challenge to the whole security community right now. Boom! I want to see a Python Static code analyzer for vulnerabilities. It doesn't exist. I thought you wanted to see a Python. I was like, we could do that. <laughs> <laughs> but no, seriously, again, my, my startup is PHP. Tons of static analyzers out there. There's not a single one for Python. We have static code analyzers, but they're more used for just kind of linting. Hmm. It doesn't exist. Yeah. And yeah, I think well, we all can agree that static analysis is amazing. I wrote one for Django. but I was going to say, didn't you write one for Django, Joe? I did, but it, it, it has uh, languished a little bit, but uh, unfortunately. But... I, I do want to highlight one point that Apollo made, and that was context. And that was really what I was trying to say. Know your environment means, you know, you can employ all these things, but, but the ability to 
if you're a leader in an organization, the ability to get your people to understand the context within which they're operating is probably the most important thing. Because the, the, the data that you're working with, the stuff that you're going to extract, the incidents that you're going to chase after, the um, unusual behavior that you're going to have in your network environments has all got a context around it. And if those people don't know the context, all the technology in the world doesn't mean crap. Yeah, but just keep in mind, Jeff, everything you – I agree with you. I'm less passionate about it than you, but I agree. But, but then there's also there's – we have resource constraints, and we can't do it all. Mm -hmm. so, there, so when you know your environment, you also have to understand your prioritization. What makes the organization successful? What creates value? What makes it money? Where do, where do we need to spend those resources, and, and how do we focus on that? And that's where I also think security has a really fantastic opportunity. People are interested. People care about it. Okay, well then why are we still solving some of the same problems? Why aren't we letting other people take some of that responsibility to handle some of those pieces with us? And so, you know, again, I, 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 I'm saddened that it's another week of uh, we release bugs, we tell everybody they're stupid, we have evidence that points out that people are stupid, uh, we're stupid. I mean, come on, guys, we've got to stop that. That doesn't... That's that's not the language of leadership. That's not the language of, of – I'm not even sure I like winning and losing uh, in terms of security. I think it's an infinite game. And when you look at infinite games, the, the question you ask yourself is, if there's no winner or loser but we're going to keep playing, then, then did I make everybody better today? So at the end of the day, at the end of the week, at the end of the month, at the end of the cycle, at the end of the quarter, is your organization better today than it was 90 days ago? Are the people around you better today than they were 90 days ago? Yeah? Well, so Mike, Mike did, great. Tenable did this video where they asked people, so if a CEO comes to you and asks you, uh, how secure are we? What's your answer? Well, let me start by saying I thought that was brilliant. I didn't, I didn't get a chance to really watch it, but yeah. I love that question. Um, you know, I, look, I, I think the... As everybody's pointed out, the answer is always contextual. Mm -hmm. Frankly, CEO comes to me and says, hey, Michael, how secure are we? I, I start by saying, that's a great question. Why are you asking? Like, not, not adversarial. Mm -hmm. Say, there's a lot of answers to that. That's kind of a nuanced answer. Well, and if he, if he has to you ask... You can't answer that with yes. Yeah, how, I mean, how secure are we? Purple. Yeah. Because Venus <laughs> is in retrograde. It's, what? It's like, but you, the, uh, I thought if the CEO is coming to you and asking that, that could be a problem in and of itself, right? That means yeah, you have, it someone be. hasn't talked to the CEO about the security level of the organization. Yeah, but it also could be that they don't know how to ask that question, yeah. right? The, 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 they, they see you, they go, oh, it's Paul. Paul's a security. Hey, Paul, how are we doing? How secure are things? Yeah, we're yeah. fucked. And, and, and so <laughs> <laughs> Not what the CEO wants to hear. Maybe the truth, though. It might be the truth. Don't lie. I think the, the best advice I have for you in that situation, don't lie. I mean, Lying look, I, I, I tell you, we're I, fucked. I, I, <laughs> that would be yes. I'm probably going to have a really awesome answer in about two hours when I keep thinking about this. Yeah. But chances are, what I would do off the cuff is is kind of say, uh, I think we're doing pretty well. There's some. There's always some room for improvement. Is there something you're interested in? I'd love to give you more. And then, and then, what I would probably say is, when can you give me 15 minutes? I'd like to give you a proper intelligence briefing. Yeah. And I don't mean I threaten right and all other crap. I'd love to say, when can you give me 15 minutes? I'm not going to look, I'm not going to ask for a dime. I'm not going to try to build a kingdom. I want to give you a pretty under, I want to give you a pretty clear understanding of the lay of the land. And, and I'm going to need a little time to prepare for this. And then I'd love to have a conversation to better understand and make sure that I am aligned with our priorities. Because really, you know, and, and the only other thing I would probably say is, and I, I, like I said, I'll come up with a really artful way to say this in about an hour. But you want to emphasize to them that it's not just about prevention, that part of what you're looking at is how rapidly you can detect if something goes wrong and how appropriately you can respond. And gosh, you'd sure love to have that conversation with them. Mm -hmm. And you know what I'm going to say? Shit, I just asked you how secure we are. <laughs> well, yeah, I was I mean, thinking I mean, the same thing, Larry. Right, well, then you're See, still... you know, the hard-ass CEO Mike is going to say, Mike, that's great. But answer the fucking question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, when and do you think I have 15 yeah. minutes on my schedule? Yeah. I'm going to play it, golf, it, it, Mike. I got, I got tea time. Oh, tea time. Shit. That's one of two answers, right? And the answer is uh, I'm doing my level best or we're screwed. Mm. Yeah, and sometimes that's about the same answer. It's going to fire your ass. 
Yeah, and, and Mike, well, sometimes uh, that answer is the same. I'm doing my level best, and we're screwed. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, if if 2014, wait a sec. If 2014 has taught us anything, our mindset has to completely change. It is not if something happens. It is when, when something happens. Right. Assume breach. Assume Which is breach. Not defeatist. People keep telling me it's defeatist. It, it is mean not defeatist in all the it, time. It, it just means somebody can get in if they want to. It, it's not defeatist. In fact, it's quite empowering because if you assume, if you're a sea level person and you assume breach and you take that approach, you will refocus your personal assets appropriately to understand that that is part of your working business process now, and you will take appropriately away from the defender side and you will set teams after the assumed breach premise you'll say go chase this stuff and that's actually important larry you want to talk about hacking voting machines oh god this one was oh jesus so this one came from uh shania's blog but there was he was referencing in uh, another article it is a um uh, an election machine used in virginia uh, the AVS win vote um, that uh, passed necessary voting system standards and been used in Virginia and until recently Pennsylvania and Mississippi. Um, it is based on Windows XP embedded that has not been updated in 10 years. It hasn't received, received a security patch since 2004. Um, the admin passwords were admin, A, B, C, D, E, and shoop. Um, <laughs> which allegedly you were not able to change. Um, the it uses Wi-Fi to do um, correlation, and it uses WEP. <laughs> so once you have WEP and you have the admin password, you can now connect to the machine and then um, enumerate shares. Once you enumerate shares, you can connect to them. And then I want to say it was an access database. Oh, excellent. Yeah, Microsoft, you uh, take a copy of the access database, modify it, and then re-upload it to the machine when, right after voting so, has stopped, and then you can change the election. <clears throat> Clearly, it wasn't a technology company that designed the solution. I'd be shocked. The problem is that I think they've actually been in use for 10 years. Oh, so they bought them 10, ten years, years ago, ago. And they've and never been it. updated. Yeah. That's, right, that's because my it's a toaster, right? The yeah. thing is a yeah. toaster. Well, yeah, you know, I mean, I've looked at this before. And, and I, I'm going to sidestep as much of the politics of this as, as is reasonable. We tend to do things... And we build a set of expectations, and then we find out 10 years later, well, those weren't valid expectations. But if you go back and you look at the requirements for it, the requirements didn't look at any of these things. Mm -hmm. and, and nobody at the beginning talked about it, and yet I'm willing to bet somebody come forward, I've, I've pointed that out for years. Yeah, and, and people poo pooed you. You know why? One in the contract, contract already paid for, people already had it, there's no more money for it, and it always goes back to what's the problem we're trying to solve. solve. Yep. Voting. Secure voting. Right. And, and so we, we've taken something that used to either record a tally on a paper tape or you had a punch card, depending on where you were. And, and, and we went to something that's incredibly complex. I can't remember the name of it. There was a this just about a decade ago. This is back when I was still podcasting. There was a company that, that had developed a, a way of voting that was all paper based. And yet it, it used like, a, I'm going to say, a mild form of encryption. I, I might be technically inaccurate with that. But basically, uh, oh, it's called punch scan or something like that. And the point was you, you could vote. You could, you could scan it in. You had a record that you voted, but the key for what you voted to was now gone. But yet you could still verify that your vote was accurate. It was cheap. It was fast. It was open source. It was, I mean, like you looked at it. And it was like, well, there's not really a downside to this. Well, sure there is. There, there wasn't enough interest in, in actually solving Whoa. the problem. Ooh, I wonder if they still you. exist now. Wow, that smells wonderful. Oh, come on, Paul. Throw me a story here. <sighs> um, I wanted to talk about... Uh, Crash, your favorite eye device. This is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I Paulo and I were talking about this on the car way down here. I uh, thought Tony this was kind of... I thought this was kind of... No, which one are you talking about? The crashing, the Wi-Fi bug? Yeah. 
in yeah. iOS where you can yeah. crash it, send it into an endless well, loop or whatever? Actually, it's a TLS HTTPS kind of bug, right? Well, it's, it's TLS based on your authentication type for your wireless network. Yeah. Because uh, Peep will use TLS. Right, right. Go That's ahead, Larry. Good. You take it. You take it. How, what is hair? in that line? Oh, how's is your... that why they call it a hairy Larry? Yeah. <laughs> so we're making... Hold on. Timeout. <laughs> Cocktail timeout. <laughs> Cocktail like timeout. So uh, we made the hairy Larry. And, and it's hairy. Can we get it? We don't have, we don't have a close-up camera. I don't know if you can see so, that. <laughs> there's actually ginger, freshly shaven ginger. Oh, is if that you're going to make is? a hairy Larry, you mm. have to make sure you and shave the I am not freshly shaven. <laughs> you have to sh that's, look at how beautiful that is. So this is a rum-based cocktail. We used an uh, old monk, mm. yeah. which is a, kind of somewhat of an obscure black rum. It's actually from India. Uh, if you got to want to get the thing in your nose, actually either get straws or you know, dunk it in, whatever. Mm. <laughs> so the, okay, I'll, I'll just you know the oh. way I understand this one is if you stand up a malicious hotspot and you are in range with your iOS device, uh, and I believe it has to try to authenticate. Yes. Larry, if, please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, it will DOS it, and your iOS device will just crash. Yes. Yeah, so here's the deal: you wait for probe requests from a device, and then you stand up an access point as those probe requests, but you change the security type to PEEP with TLS, leveraging TLS, and then provide via TLS a uh, improperly formatted certificate, which the iOS device will process as part of that authentication scheme, and then reboot. Oh, and then excellent. when it starts back up, if that access point is there, it, it beacons, it, it responds, boom, again, reboots. Over so and over again. Because until you're out of range. Of until that you're out of range point. or you do control C on your malicious access point. That, that's just fabulous. That's like a why didn't I think of that. <clears throat> yep. There was another one for uh, WPA supplicant. <coughs> Did you see this one, Larry? I, I saw this today. Um, and this is, if I remember, was looking at it, um, I got a, the Wi-Fi client vulnerability could expose Android WPA supplicant. On Linux, BSD, and OS X, um, what was the particular vulnerability? When config P2P option is enabled. Yeah, I don't. I, I, I read the. I don't know what config P2P is. I'm tempted to say that's where you like. Sh it's like the local hotspot kind of kind of systems. You can go into Mac. And you can go under the uh, network sharing systems. Oh yeah, so you have like, like a, you have um, a hard line, and then you share it over through the Wi-Fi, like a local. Okay, that's what I think it is. But what is they didn't actually say in the article what this is a terrible article. Mm -hmm. They did say that unfortunately WPA supplicant is used on embedded systems for which patches are not frequently released or easy to install, which I thought was kind of funny. And here we are again on that problem. Oh yeah. Per okay. All right. So it looks like you found a better article. Oh, we got to talk about the elephant in the room, though. Yes. Yeah. Let's move on to the elephant in the room. What's the elephant in the room? WordPress. Oh, WordPress. What I didn't see this. So I, the, this I'm so glad you this, took the charge. This one of. was very interesting, I thought, because we've been talking about WordPress vulnerabilities for eons. And the thing that I pulled out of this article that when I saw the distillation of this article was, hey, you know why there's the, one of the popular developers for a WordPress plugin said, hey, you know why I had this thing? is because in the developer documentation, it never said that I needed to uh, filter input on these particular variables. They weren't finding a very good tutorial to learn from. They were not. <laughs> that's a good they were point. not. Yeah, but that's thi point but this was from the WordPress developer's guide from WordPress itself. That's messed up. Yeah. 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 So, so they ended up with more than a dozen, and probably counting and going up, uh, plugins that are vulnerable because they used the uh, add query arg and remove query arg function calls, and they assumed that those functions would escape the uh, user input when... And, they did and not. And, it, and, they did and not. it was never noted in the documentation that they did not uh, either escape or filter input on these. Yeah. And so you never had to do noted, it so plugins all over the place are vulnerable to this, um, and that one will probably... It's kind of going to be like, uh, like you know, sort of the MSO eight hundred sixty seven of WordPress. It's going to keep on giving. And, and you know, and my, the, but this is reflective cross site scripting. Uh, it, I didn't notice whether it was reflective or stored. It's probably reflected. I just want to ask. It a says steal question. user accounts, change settings, or fish passwords from unsuspecting uh, I users. I think I think it would depend on the plugin, actually. Yeah. Yep. Apollo uh, wants to Apollo reflects. wants to ask a stupid question. There are no stupid questions, only stupid answers. Yeah. <laughs> is why don't we have a marketplace where we're fuzzing these things on a regular basis? It's free, it's automated, it's simple. Yeah, I think it'll take time to analyze. I think 
I think someone their did argument, that and found that they were all vulnerable. Yeah, I think uh, <laughs> the argument also was is there's forty thousand different plugins. I mean, ain't nobody got time for that. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's the thing too. Is I um, I was at a conference uh, about two years ago, and they were talking about uh, JavaScript vulnerabilities in Firefox. And they went to Firefox and said, "Hey, why don't you just you know try and security analyze these plugins and at least give them a rating of some kind?" And they're like, "Eh, I'd rather yeah. not." Mm -hmm. Hmm. So. Well, that's like what Blackphone was, was doing, is validating the security of apps, and they're going to come up with a, a rating scale, basically. Mm -hmm. And it's different. Like, once they analyze the code, they say they're going to be ranked with the highest security, and then there's other ones where, we, you know, we talk to them, and they seem like they're following best practices. You know, maybe they fall into a different category. Do you guys think that'll be more common? Yeah, I absolutely I mean, do. I, I hope it yeah. does. Mm -hmm. yeah. I just feel like this past year, we've just been hit over the head. <laughs> so. Yeah. This yeah. is true. I don't know. Oh, there was another story that I thought was... Uh, oh, I know what it was. Man guns down computer after getting <laughs> fed up with blue screen of death. Now, this is a very important question I have for the crew. So now we've all been there, right? Well, maybe we haven't actually fired shots into our computer and gotten charges against us for discharging a mm -hmm. firearm in a residential area. But um, we've all been ready to take aim at our computer, right? Now, my question is... What is the best firearm to use when unleashing your fury on a computer? <laughs> uh, I don't Larry, know. This, be this, your this, is, this is short range, up close and personal, and you know I, I'm a I'm a fan of the Glock 19, so I, I'd I'd go for that. I'm sure up, clo up close and personal. I, you know, I, I really think a baseball bat will do a much better job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, if I pull out the thirty out six, I'm going to have to go take it out to the range, and that's yeah. There, there's always you good say that. My choice is AK-47 because those things are going through whatever metals inside the computer. Oh, yeah, if you're but you're angling, do, you're angling you down at the floor. It's fine. Just, just, just bring out the trusty um, old twelve. Gauge. Car you Carlos, big old hole in there. Yeah, Carlos, Carlos, Carlos come on. Help us out here. If if if, if 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 you point it all the way down to the floor, it may deflect and you may lose a pinky. That's true. <laughs> yeah. Or worse. You could. Yep. Or, or worse. Or testicle. <laughs> Apollo would just stab it with his wine tool, right? That's right. Yeah. That's what he said. I, I, I remember one time doing a drill. It was around vehicles. And all of a sudden, I had to shoot through the doors. I went in, it was a 762. I, I, I was going like, ah, this is going through both doors, hitting the target the other side. I don't need to calculate any deviation or anything. Place a couple of shots, and when we were looking at the video, I'm going like, why is there a puff of smoke 90 degrees to the right of the target? Uh oh. And it, and it actually deviated. Something in <clears throat> one of the doors deflected that bullet, and it, it just went 90 degrees to the side. I'm like, Oh, good to know. Good to know. See, I could take out multiple computers with one shot. Yeah. <laughs> and, and huh? Too, or yeah. your pesky neighbor. Oh, yep, boy. Or, or your a wife. pesky neighbor. Yeah, uh, your wife so by accident. Uh, any other stories you want to talk about? We're running a little short on time now. Yeah. But you know, go I ahead, had, guys. I, well, I, I just had one, and <laughs> I was actually curious your, your take on it. There was a story Excuse that me. ran in Fast Company this week. Uh, Dutch homes get free heating if they agree to host a computer server. And no doubt, those suckers kick out some heat. So I, I totally get it. Um, is this a smart idea? Is this a bad idea? I mean, I, I, I'm from the school that says if you can physically access the box, you can own it. So the thought of having a company stick a bunch of servers in, in my house to give me heating, okay, I like that part to it. But from who's, a company perspective, what? Who's, yeah, who's paying for the electricity? Yep. And... Sure, free heat. Who's paying for the electricity? And absolutely, physical is is key. But now it's also like the same thing with your power meter on the house. You put a power meter on the side of your house and you go hack it. Well, that's not yours, and that's a criminal offense. So. Well, well, the the other <coughs> issue is actually flat out operational. I mean, who's have they got the bandwidth to do that? I mean, what if it's a it's, big bandwidth? It's home? the Netherlands, yes, that they do. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna move there. Mm. <laughs> and host a server for free heat. Yeah. Yeah, baby. Awesome. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's an interesting idea from a security perspective. It's it's um it's a god awful idea though because I mean, how are you going to manage that? Holy smokes. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's the I cloud. Mean, I like the fresh ginger. Mm -hmm. I mean, Sorry. look, I, I don't want to suggest that they didn't pay attention to it at all, but all they said is, "No, no, there's no concerns. I mean, we'll know if you're tampering with it." And I'm just looking at that going History suggests otherwise. You know, I, I think in terms of who pays for the electricity, who, like I think that there's either certain things that they're 
they're looking for that they they compensate whatever and the idea behind it is instead of me building a, a, a data center with a bunch of racks and a bunch of stuff in that and, and i'll just i'll go put these in people's houses to me it feels kind of like well that's a neat idea by the way i i kind of like knowing that there's a data center that has security that has redundant power that has mm -hmm. redundant signals it's yeesh, this seems a little weird to me so I don't know. It's 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 just interesting. About when I put it out on Twitter, a bunch of folks uh, said they really liked it. The security people they said this is great. I would do it, and I don't I don't think they were joking. So I just I was kind of curious if I missed something because I. Oh, I think I would do it for free heat, and totally the Bob and me would hack it. <laughs> but um, as a company, I don't know that I would go send my servers to other people's houses, mm. knowing how nervous. easy this. Yeah. It makes me nervous. Yeah, I agree. And, uh, so with that, we're oh. going to take a short break. And we're going to come back, and we're going to wrap up the show. So stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> and we're back. Now, what is, the, what is this one? This is the Smoking Hot Acidorian. Okay. What is this one again? Smoking Hot Acidorian. Okay, just checking. What is... <laughs> <laughs> you just wanted to... Wait, what is this one? This is Harry. Harry. Hey. Harry Larry. <laughs> Harry Larry. Look, my Harry Larry and my smoking hot Asadorian are touching. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and they're, rub they're rubbing together, too. <laughs> and yet he wouldn't touch with the Joffin off from the off and Joffin. Uh, I'd be, before we go real quick, I really enjoyed Carlos's uh, story that he brought wow, about. Wow, that's different. Uh, the TLS certificate deployment doing GPO uh, because we were working with a customer that's having a hard time doing this. So, Carlos, I'm sending them this blog. Cool. Oh, yeah. Nice blog post, Carlos. I yeah. put that in there in the show notes. So, um, Carlos Joff, thank you guys for joining us remotely via Skype and Michael as well. Always a pleasure. Thank you guys. Uh, Wonderful having It's good you. joining y'all. Y'all. Santa, Santa, Santa Can Jello. Can Jello. Make sure you get your. You should get your own, like, Can Jello line, dude. I'm going to have to now. You're going to have to buy some Can Jello and then make some labels for it and take it to the next security conference. I want to work yeah. with Apollo, though, and, and make sure that it's uh, it, it tastes good and, and packs a little punch. Yeah, Ooh, he could probably make fun. you a, a drink that uses Can Jello. I, I was thinking about that, too. Santa Arc Jello shots. Yes, Jello shots. There you go. Can right, Jello I mean, shots. Beautiful. I, you know, actually, Santa Arc had Jello. I don't even know how to say your name. Uh, you need to use the plural, and that's all y'all. All y'all. All y'all. That's right. You're all right. All y'all. It's well, been good being with all y'all. Larry, and that is probably the first and last time you'll ever hear me say that. <laughs> Love to share cocktails with Larry, so to speak. He's admiring his hairy Larry. He's admiring his hairy Larry. Very, I'm admiring very, your hairy Larry. It's very hairy. It's very like, hairy. It's just kind of like me. It is, it's a drink tailored after you. I know. And um, Apollo, of course, thank you very much for... Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's, so it's been fun. great. Uh, you can come back anytime and make drinks, of course, and appear on the show. We'd love to have you. That'd be cool. Uh, we appreciate your, your um, cocktail oh. making and your contribution to the show as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. It's fantastic. Anytime. So uh, tell everyone what's in the smoking Hot Acidorian. So this is just a crazy-ass cocktail. I mean, so the Harry Larry, that's this, you can't find this at a bar. Like, no one, no one knows what this is. The smoking Hot Acidorian... This doesn't exist anywhere. This is a completely original. This is your this cocktail. This is your, you, well, you developed this cocktail. This is brand new. I mean, I made it literally when you guys put out the request. Um, so I have this interesting thing called tobacco liquor. I found it at Marty's in Boston. It was on the discount shelf. Like, no one knew what the hell it was. I'm like, no tobacco one liquor. I'm, I'm actually scared about the tobacco liquor. Yeah, so the tobacco liquor it's is the really fire cider you should be scared of. So about. there's also so the base is rye whiskey, one shot of rye whiskey, half a shot of tobacco liquor, and then a little like a third of a shot, very small amount, third third of an ounce I should say, of uh, fire cider, which is apple cider vinegar with uh, ginger, turmeric, uh, habaneros. It's like this old New England kind of like health tonic, yeah, kind of cold thing. cold That's remedy. It's a yeah, yeah, it is a cold remedy. Oh, yeah. entirely. Yeah. So what's really cool is you know I wanted to go for like a cigar flavor. So what's in a cigar? You got to get some tobacco, a yeah. little earthiness from the rye whiskey, and a little bit of spice. So. It's wonderful. I, I really like that's it. Good. I don't know that's if I'd pair it with a cigar. It probably wouldn't pair well with a cigar. You but as, try a, it, as yeah. a cocktail on its own, it's, like it, it smells <clears throat> faintly like a 
cigar. It Doesn't does. It? Yeah. yeah, it has a little tobacco. That's the thing, too. Spicy liquor, uh, spicy cocktails. It's really obscure. You can find them at craft cocktail places, but yeah. a lot of them do things like mezcal and uh, I love scotch. I've never had a smoky. spicy cocktail like that. Yeah. And like you said, it's original. Yep. So yep. cheers. Cheers to you guys. Here. Cheers, hey, Larry. So now that Apollo is set Cheers to your Harry, Harry Larry. Mm-hmm. I think we have a challenge, and that is for for at least one bar in every state of the union to take on these three drinks, these three wonderful drinks, um, you know, including the uh, Joff and Off. And Joff me off. Joff me off. Joff the me Joff off. me off. Old the Harry Larry Jack. and the hot smoking ass Paul. Oh, don't forget the old fashioned Jack. Jack. Don't you can't forget the old fashioned oh, Jack. And the, oh, <laughs> Jack or, might forget it because he's old, but. And uh, furthermore, may I say that I th- I think we should start in Vegas and have our favorite um, little Vegas uh, night outfit. Frankie's. Uh, Frankie's. Thank you. I'm looking for it. Good Lord. Take on these drinks as part of that menu would just be exceedingly awesome. Jack could probably bridge that gap and um, get them on it. So, uh, you know, assuming need... that Apollo would agree to such a thing happening because it was. You need to license them your drink, royalty I won't, fees. I won't stop you guys. Or is this open source? We're going to open source this, the drink. This, these are open source cocktails <laughs> because <laughs> I, 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 I love it. Believe, a Creative Commons nice. license. I believe it's my responsibility as a member of the IT community to give back. And nice. you gave cocktails. And I gave cocktails. Well, what about okay. those of us that don't have the budget for such exotic liquors? What's no, they're, they're not all that expensive. No. That's why you go to France. No, that's where you're wrong, Mike. They're not. The I mean, they're not as cheap as can jello, but I mean. Come See, on. you went right to the negativity. <laughs> <laughs> the individual liquors themselves, the most expensive one's only about 30 bucks. All right. So the Marinquina is about 35. Um, so, yeah, individual ingredients, not as much. But again, if you want to make the full cocktails, you're going to spend some time and look for the ingredients. Honestly, I have no idea where to get tobacco liquor. I got really lucky because I basically bought them out of that. Mm. Um, I looked up online. There actually is a tobacco liquor from, I'm tempted to say France, but it's like 120 bucks a bottle. So mm. I, it's funny. I talked to one of the cigar shops downtown. They sell a lot of really good pipe tobacco, L and J Peretti. Mm-hmm. And uh, the guy's like, I said, oh, I'm thinking about infusing, you know, a good grain alcohol with a really nice t- pipe tobacco. He looked at me and said, no, that is dangerous. Oh, really? Well, it kind of makes sense, too. Because it much... draws out so much of the nicotine? Exactly. Yeah, yeah a lot of the nicotine, a lot of preserves. Mm. So to do that, you have to have an actual still. But again, I'm leaving a bottle here for you guys. Thank you very much. So <laughs> enjoy. Awesome. Um, so, yeah, that's this episode of Security Weekly. Keep calm and drink on, I guess, <laughs> Yeah, as it, as it were. So yeah. over, thank you, everyone, for listening. Larry? Over and cocktails. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, everybody. Cheers. Huge shout out mm. to my Scottish and Irish friend. I'm going to bring up my glasses now, Harry. That's good. I like the I like this one. Glad you like a it. lot. It's gonna give me heartburn later. But yeah, I mean, that's <laughs> okay. Spicy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like the spice. So I get the ginger though. to help settle that, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true. You could kind of alternate, and it would. Yeah. And I'm gonna back up. Double fisted. <laughs> you got to get cocktails for for Santar Cangelo now. Mr. Santar Cangelo needs a cocktail.